Y'all know my, Michael Phelps? The most decorated Olympic athlete of all time. And uh, he is there today. But you know what? Just a few months ago, he was fighting a battle in secret. He uh, was fighting the battle of addictions. Can you hear me? Sounds like my mic went off. Can you get me there? Hello, hello, hello. My battery out. Hello, hello. I'll talk loud. There. I got real loud, didn't I? Now you can hear me. Just a few months ago, ago though, Michael Phelps was fighting a battle. And uh, in fact, he, had, uh, he got a second DWI. And he went into a deep, dark depression. And he said that he hid out in his room. He didn't eat, hardly sleep for a week while he contemplated suicide. But uh, he had a friend. He had a tribesman. And uh, Ray Lewis stepped up. And Ray Lewis came. And he said, you know what? None of us can carry these kinds of burdens by ourselves. I'm here to be your tribe. I will walk with you. He gave him a book. It was Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. And while reading that book, he realized the help that can come from God and the help that can come from a friend. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In front of this fantastic set, you know, still the, the uh, African safari set, it takes a tribe. Last week we talked about how it takes a tribe to thrive, to do things that by ourselves we couldn't do. And, and we had a great example of that the week before with VBS, how a huge tribe came together and pulled off this miracle with God's help. And today we're going to though, talk about it takes a tribe to survive because you and I are not intended to do this life by ourselves. We need a tribe. Let's get closer to home. Kelly and I have a friend. In fact, Kelly's closest friend in life. I'm not going to call her name, but... Uh, uh, and her former husband. One of my very closest friends in life. In fact, we named our son after him. And... Uh, well, Susan got an email one day from a perfect stranger. I said her name. I didn't intend to do that. She got an email from a perfect stranger and confirmed something that she had feared for a long time. And my friend, her husband, had been unfaithful repeatedly for many years. And so Susan had to say it again. She had a choice to make, didn't she? She could just out be so embarrassed and so heartbroken. She could have just balled up and carried that secret all by herself. They won't tell anybody. But she didn't. She told her tribe. And she called Kelly. And Kelly called me. I remember where I was sitting when the call came in. And uh, because Susan called on her tribe, I keep saying her name. This is a very personal story. These, these are real people. Michael Phelps is far, far away. But you and I have friends in our lives who we can't but call by name. And uh, they've called upon us to be their tribe. And we call upon you, we call upon our tribesmen to walk with us through things that we never would be able to walk through by ourselves. And you know what? It turned out okay. She survived. And it's a story now of redemption. And, uh, but it was so key that back there she just didn't keep a secret, but she called her tribe. In fact, when our pastor called her, when he got word, that was the question he asked her, who's your tribe? Because he knew that if she would share this next bumpy road journey with her tribesmen, that it would be okay. With God's help and her tribe's help, it would turn out okay, wouldn't it? But you know, isn't that how tempting, it's tempting to all of us when something embarrassing or a personal failure even, and, and sometimes even an illness. You know, we don't want to become the subject of conversation, and so we hide. It was the very first consequence of the fall. Remember when Adam and Eve did exactly what God said not to do. What did they do first? They hid from each other. And we've been hiding ever since. And it's so tempting when we fail or we have a heartbreak or, or even when one that we love dearly fails, then we, we just want to hide because we don't want anybody to know that. 
And uh, just think of it. You know, this morning we all came to church and you guys are all pretty and dressed up like you stepped out of a Sears catalog. And, uh, you know, we greet you at the door or while we're meeting a guest, we say, how are you doing? And what do we all say? Fine. But you know what? Everybody in this room is fighting a battle on some front. If you're not, you come tell me afterwards. That if I have any understanding of the human situation, all of us are by fighting some battle on some front. And we need the tribe. We need the tribesmen. I do. And we need each other. Otherwise, you know, we'll just say we're fine. We'll dress up like we are. You know, think of what we compare ourselves to. We look at Facebook and everybody, they're posting the highlights. You know, this is my dog. This is my cat. This is my food. You know, everything's great. Everybody's healthy and wealthy and wise. And I'm comparing that, their highlight reel, to my real reel. And my real reel isn't like that. I've got stuff that uh, I only share with my tribe. I don't share it on Facebook. But thank the good Lord, I have a tribe that I share that with. Go to the next slide if you would, Les, please. Uh, just last week, you know that I spent my time with the grand tribe that I'm part of in Texas Baptist Student Ministry, 160-something of us together in Dallas. And uh, we share prayer requests, and one of the times that we did during one of our times of worship together, we just asked everybody to write a prayer request, and we stuck them on whiteboards around the room. And uh, I was heartbroken when I saw this one. You can see that, can you not? I'm moving, it's stressful. My family is broken. My brother isn't talking to me. My mom is struggling with addiction and finances. My father and brother are very racist. Loving my family takes all that I have sometimes. I'm very sad lately in that last line. I feel very alone. Man. Go to the next slide. He wrote that when he was in the presence, in the very room with this grand tribe of people, the people that I work with on a daily basis. But it, all of those things hurt so badly. And I guess he was afraid that if he, if, he, if he were that candid with us, you know, that was shared anonymously, no names. That was how we were instructed to do that. But I was just thinking, there's somebody in that picture who wrote, those things and he felt so very very alone isn't it possible we're all practiced at that we, we can be in the company of people who would love us receive us instead of criticize us for the things that aren't going well in our life they'd stand with us like Ray Lewis stood with Michael Phelps and yet the temptation is the temptation is just to hide and to suffer in secret that we would not do that it takes a tribe it takes a tribe and that's what I would like for us to talk about today there's a grand Grand story in the Bible, and uh, I was looking at it today, and if you want to go ahead and go to that. You know, there's, here's, there's a picture about a, a man who literally had to be carried by his tribe to get the help of Jesus. And from the, the story we're going to read here in just a second, the man doesn't have a word to offer. No word that he ever spoke is recorded in this story. It's a story about a man for whom, if it were not for his tribe, would have suffered in secret. But he had a tribe, and they came. And I even wonder if they did so against his will. I really do. I wonder if that could have been a backstory. If when these men came to say, hey, we're your tribe, we know where you can get help, and we're going to take you. I wonder if he said, no, 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 don't go to, you, go to any trouble. I, I'm, I'm be, no, we are your tribe. We are going to take you to get help. And this is the story that followed, and you can read along with me while I read it. It's right out of the book of Luke. You know, that's the series that we've been working on for a long time. And some of you guys are wondering if I know anything in the Bible besides the book of Luke. And I do, but I sure do like Luke. And this is one of the grand stories about a tribe that stepped up. And because of the tribe, this great story. Read it with me, okay? Luke chapter 5, we'll begin at verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. I picture them all dressed up. You know, like the Sears catalog picture. Here we are, we're all, we're all happy and wealthy and fine, and uh, things are going. They'd come from every village in Galilee, from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And there's all kinds of sicknesses, aren't there? They're not just physical. The power of Jesus to heal. 
Picture this. They made a scene. So men came carrying a paralyzed man. Paralyzed is the word that's used for him. And I'm using that as a metaphor for the things that I know in my life that have paralyzed me, tempted to paralyze me in the past. He was paralyzed. And they brought him on a mat and tried to take him into the house, lay him before Jesus. But it was too big a crowd. They couldn't even get in the door. When they could not find a way to do so, because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. Now let's picture this, okay? It wasn't a roof like this. It would have been a building that to us would have been pretty crude. And it would have had tiles. It would have had a tile roof, you know, clay tiles, baked clay. And those would have been attached to poles or beams uh, going horizontally. And so these tiles were just laid up there, stacked up there. And uh, these guys made a scene. Because they had a member of their tribe that was paralyzed. And they were not going to let that stay the case. So here we go. We keep reading. So they went up on the roof. And they lowered him. Imagine that. Somebody climbing around on this roof and letting a guy down in the front. That's how desperate they were because of their care for their tribesmen. And how confident they were in Jesus' ability to heal. Both real, right? Both real. So they lowered him down the mat, had taken the ties in the middle of the room, right in front of Jesus. And when Jesus saw, look whose faith he saw. When Jesus saw their faith, then he mentioned the paralyzed man. When Jesus saw the faith of his tribesmen, you know what? Sometimes I'll need to be carried because my tribe will have faith that I don't have at the time. And it was their faith, his tribe's faith that Jesus saw and he said this, now let's see, wait a minute the guy's paralyzed, what's Jesus talking about? Your sins are forgiven what, why, what, does Jesus not know what's going on here? Did he miss something? This guy's paralyzed he doesn't have anything to do with sin or does it? You know I think you know this is my speculation and, and so I, I admit that I believe all sickness is also a consequence of the fall and, you know, some of the sickness that we experience is because we live in a fallen world. There are corporate, con corporate consequences to this fall. We all suffer because of the fall. But sometimes, sometimes, I have, I'm suffering because of my own sins. I've done things to get me in a place where I'm suffering. And I have no one to blame. I don't have society to blame. I don't have you to blame. I have me to take responsibility. Well, Jesus saw through all of that, I think, and so he dealt with the root issue, not just the consequences, but he dealt with the root issue. And he goes on, skip down a little bit in verse 24. So he said to the paralyzed man, the first time Jesus spoke to him, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. I'm thinking home. It's a place where his tribe is. Don't go by yourself. Go back to your tribe. Immediately stood up in front of them, took what had, been, what had been lying on the mat, and went home praising God. And everyone was amazed. You know, isn't that what happens sometimes when, when I got to work on my other home church staff, First Baptist in San Antonio, got to lead the single adults ministry there, everything, everybody from college to deceased. We had all ages of single adults. And we went through a series of, uh, instead of on Sunday mornings, you know, at the beginning of our Sunday school time, instead of some, someone standing up and sharing their victory story, we had people stand up and share their suffering stories. And for week in and week out, those courageous, brave tribesmen would stand in front of that group and say, you know what? I have this battle that I'm fighting. And... The battle's not over yet. I'm still right in the thick of things. I'm still in the middle of it. But I'm counting on God, and I'm counting on you to walk with me through this battle. And you know the effect that it had on the people? You could just almost feel the relief in the room. Everybody was going, I'm not the only one. Because somebody had the courage to share their battle. Battle that wasn't won yet. I'm not the only one. 
I don't have to pose as if everything's okay because it's not. And week in and week out, they shared their stories. And it was incredible what that group became. It became the kind of place where people could come and be honest. They could come and be candid. And they would walk with each other. Man, it became a tribe. It was a great thing to see. Well, that's what happened this day. Because of a man's tribe, then he got the help that he really needed. And they came through. They came through for him. But I got to looking. Go ahead, let's look at that next slide. This isn't the only story like that in the Bible. There was story after story after story. And what do all of these stories have in common? One stood up in behalf of another who was in a bad, bad place and intervened in their behalf. The other thing that happened is the one who was suffering let his tribesmen intervene. He gave him permission. He let him. And just think, in each of these cases, you're familiar with those stories as you read through there. Each of these stories... Somebody went to Jesus because of their care for their friend or family member who is suffering. And what do we call that today? When you go to Jesus on behalf of another one, what's that called? That's called prayer, isn't it? They went to Jesus and their friend or family member's behalf and without Jesus even having to come on sight in all but one of these cases, spoke from remote then the person was healed. But it wouldn't happen, would it, without the intervention of a tribesman. Somebody stepped up. You know, there's two lessons here that I need to, to learn from this. Number one, keep my eyes open. When I see somebody around me suffering, come along beside them. Instead of, oh no, they probably are too embarrassed. No, no I'm going to invite myself in. And the other lesson for me is, when I'm suffering, let my tribe come in. Don't hide, don't retreat, don't go to the room, quit eating, quit sleeping, contemplating terrible things. Invite my tribe in. Invite them in. And story after story after story. These are a collaborative effort. A team, a tribe member and Jesus came together. And you know, sometimes, you know, these are all conspicuous. These are all physical, some of them spiritual, but physical ailments, but sometimes our battle's not spiritual, I mean physical, it sometimes would be easier if it were, yeah, well everybody gets sick, you know, that, that's an okay, but sometimes it's, it's much more personal than that, sometimes much harder than that, oh I have some battles that I'm fighting that I wish they were so simple as to be physical, really do, but some of them aren't, they're harder than that, and so it's easier to hide them, but they need the same kind of help, they need the help of a tribesman, I need the help of the Lord. So, don't. Let's not hide from our tribe. G.K. Chesterton put it like this. We're all in a leaky boat on a stormy sea. We owe one another terrible loyalty. Tonight, I will email 14 guys. They're my tribe. I do it every Sunday night. I say, guys, here's my leaky boat this week. <laughs> help me bail and help me paddle. These guys live in three different countries. But they bail and paddle for me every single week. And thank the good Lord, from their example, from your example, from his example, and these examples, when things aren't going well for me, I don't have to hide from these guys. I've trusted them, and they've proven to be trustworthy. Man, they are good at bailing that in a leaky boat, and they're good at paddling that leaky boat. And so every week, we pray. We pray together. I hear back from about half of them every week and they share their things with me. Some of them private, just with me instead of the group. And I understand that and that's okay. In all these cases, some of these, it was just one tribesman. That's all it took. And it didn't take an army. It took one. One tribesman. Yeah, my boat's leaky. And this week there's going to be some version of a storm in the sea. And I'll need those guys bailing and paddling with me and for me. And that's why I send them an email. I hope you have somebody like that in your life. I know the fear. I, I know it personally. It would be easier just... I'm not going to share this one. I, I know what that feels like. I really do. And here's what these men and others have taught me. When I share something with them that they know that it's an act of vulnerability, 
they are complimented. You know, whatever degree to which I would think they would judge me, write me off, think poorly of me, avoid me. Now they are flattered because I would trust them with my leaky boat. And then guess what that does with them? Well, let's see. He trusted me with his leaky boat. Maybe I can trust him with mine too. And that's what this Sunday night exercise is. It's a reciprocal one. We're trusting each other. And each of us is complimented at the candor. We don't have to hide from one another. These men have taught me that. There are people in this room. They'd be flattered to be your tribe. To be, have your things shared with them. Here's a story about uh, two twins. If you'd go see, let me see where my pictures are. Uh, hold off for just a sec. Okay, there they are. There they are. Uh, these are two twins. Their, their names are Kyrie and Brielle Jackson. They're born in 1995 in uh, Medical Center in Central Massachusetts. Twelve weeks early. Real vulnerable, these little babies were. They were placed in separate incubators. That's the practice of the day, the normal practice in this country anyway. And uh, Kyrie was doing fine. I don't know if she's the red dot or the... There's a yellow dot on the diaper of the one at the bottom there. You can't see it in that picture. They put dots on them you know, so they could tell them apart. Kyrie was doing fine, but Brielle wasn't. She was tanking. She, her sick, thin little arms were turning bluish gray and her heart rate faster and faster and faster and she was gasping for air and it was critical and the new nurse knew that if something doesn't change this little Brielle is on her way out and so she got an idea she asked for the parents for permission and she said what if we just try something this is desperate you know we're, we're in critical stage here and so she put both the little babies in the same incubator together Here's what happened. Almost immediately, Brielle, the one who was doing so poorly, snuggled up against her little twin sister. She began to calm down. That makes me feel better already. I've had my versions of that. Her blood oxygen levels improved. Some of you nurses in the room know about this stuff. I'm just reading off a sheet. I don't know what it means. And then Kyrie, the one who was doing better, wrapped her little arm around her smaller sister, and that's the picture you see right there. And Brielle got well. You know, a tribe of one. Even those little bitty babies, just such a metaphor for me, for all of us. In due time, they went home, and this is what they look like today. <laughs> Ta-da! Yeah. Because it takes a tribe. It takes a tribe, doesn't it? Yeah. It takes a tribe to survive. You know what? Um, one of the things that I've, that I enjoy about you guys is how you tribe me. You know, this week, Monday, Kelly's dad passed away, and so many of you have come up and, to be my tribesmen. You know, we're praying for you guys, praying for Kelly, and hope it's going well. And you know what? It's going well. We, we are surrounded by such a grand tribe. And we, we know that it's because of your help, our tribe's help, and because of the Lord's help. It's, it's well. It's well. There was such a picture of tribe in the last days of Dan's life. Yes, his name is Dan. And we have for several decades now called his family, Kelly's family, the tribe of Dan. We literally have called them a tribe. Dan and Judy had six kids. All those kids are married. And all those kids have kids. They have 15 grandkids. 20 great-grandkids. And a bunch of those grandkids, and all the kids are married. And so we've got a huge tribe, the tribe of Dan. They were in our house at Christmas time. 50-something people, big tribe. And so, you know, Dan's had cancer for some while now, and it really progressed the last few months. But the last two weeks were really, really the tough weeks. You know, Dan's a strong man. He was a college football player, played at Duke. Tall man, 6'3", muscular. He was in law enforcement. And then he went from that into pastoring. 
Yeah, those two go together. <laughs> those of you who are in law enforcement, I, you know, I told you a few weeks ago, you're appointed by God. And then he pastored with the Methodist Church for the rest of the years of his, his ministry. Until he retri- retired a few years ago. But Dan was this big, strong football player, law enforcement preacher. And uh, when cancer started taking its toll, you know, Dan got smaller. In the last couple of his weeks, he was very, very small, very small man. But here's what happened in that room as the tribe came together. Kelly's brothers and sisters and their husbands and wives. And then the grandkids, some of them were able to come, but the, those who couldn't, they all sent emails to Dan. His tribe stood up, stood in for him. And Judy would read those emails. And Dan's mind was clear until just the last 24 hours or so. And so Dan, we watched it with our eyes. We saw the benefit of this tribe coming together. And not only were they a blessing to Dan, they were a blessing to one another. And I mean, they were taking turns and doing shifts and caring for him. And, and uh, it was a wonderful picture of tribe. So when Dan left, he left in good hands. And he knew this man who had been so self-sufficient all his life, the hardest thing for Dan to do, we all watch it with our own eyes, was to let his tribe carry him. Because he had been used to taking care of business all his life. Handing over the paying of the bills to Kelly a few weeks ago. Giving it over. Then needing to be cared for. Cleaned up. Carried. Just like the guy on the mat. And little by little, Dan began to experience what it means to be cared for. By the tribe of Dan. Yeah. So it was when I tell you, when you tell me, hey, we're praying for your family, all is well. All is well. Because we're part of a tribe. They all pitched in together. And that was a storm. That was the stormy sea last week. And we were all in this leaky boat, paddling and bailing. But it is well. It is well. So whatever your storm is, I hope you have a tribesman that you can trust it with. And if you haven't tried that yet, you can try us today. We promise you that we will walk you with you because we know our storms too. And we would be honored to share the storm with you.